New post-war old Dutch cleanser, famous for chasing dirt, presents... Nick Carter, famous for chasing crime. Every week at this time, two great names are joined as new post-war old Dutch cleanser brings you one of the most resourceful and daring characters in all detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. Why do you suppose he doesn't answer the door, Nick? I don't know, Patsy. Maybe if we look through this window, we can see. Why, Nick, what's the matter? What are you staring at? Look over there on the floor by the sofa, Patsy. Huh? Why, there's a man lying there. He's been shot in the forehead. Confound it. He's the one man in the world who could have told us why a young man who had everything to live for should want to take his own life. And now, the case of the flowery farewell. Today's exciting adventure starring Lon Clark as Nick Carter. Brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. As our story opens, we find Nick seated at his desk in his office, intently studying the front page of the evening paper. Patsy stands behind him, reading over his shoulder. Nick, it says he was only 35 years old. Yes, Patsy, he was one of the richest industrialists in the world. Hmm. And he ends up by throwing himself in a lake. Oh, it just doesn't make sense, Nick. Why would a man like that take his own life? Well, the suicide note he left in his car tells why. It's reprinted here in the paper. Oh, is it? I didn't see it. Yeah, right down here at the bottom of the column. Hmm? It is not the number of years a man has lived that enables him to say his life was justified... It is the richness and fullness of his experience. I say farewell to my own life with deep regret, and yet I am convinced that it is better for a man to die in his prime quickly and painlessly than to let old age destroy him by slow stages. Well. Pretty flowery farewell, isn't it? Well, I'll say. Imagine anyone sitting down and... Oh, I'll get it. Okay. Nick Carter speaking. Mr. Carter, my name is Mrs. Holt. Mrs. Douglas Holt. Yes, Mrs. Holt. I wonder whether you can come to my home this evening. My husband and I would like to speak to you about the death of our very good friend, Miles Kincaid. Oh, yes, the man who committed suicide. The man who died, Mr. Carter. Whether or not he committed suicide is what we'd like you to find out. So far, Mrs. Holt, I'm afraid you haven't given me any really solid grounds for your suspicions that Kincaid didn't kill himself. But Mr. Carter, Miles had everything in the world to live for. He was rich, famous, and happy. Well, according to his note, he wanted his life to end at the peak of his success. Yes, but what about his call to me yesterday? He said he had plane reservations and was leaving for Florida very soon. My wife checked on that, Mr. Carter. It's true. Yes, if he were going to commit suicide today... Why would he make arrangements for a trip at a future date? Let me ask you this. You're implying that Kincaid was murdered. But do you know of anyone who would have any reason to kill him? Well, no, I don't. How about you, Mr. Holt? No, I, I can't think of anyone. And yet you both knew him well, didn't you? Oh, yes. In fact, well, Miles and I had quite a crush on each other a good many years ago. That was before he introduced me to Douglas. He and I were partners at that time. We had a little organization that we called Inventors Incorporated... We broke up after a while, but we never lost touch with each other. And in all these years, he made no serious enemies? Well, of course, he might have, without our knowing it. Well, it still doesn't add up to murder, does it, Nick? No, not to me. Then you won't investigate this matter for us, Mr. Carter? Oh, I didn't say that, Mr. Holmes. Oh, I wish you would, Mr. Carter. I just know something's wrong somewhere. I've got a... Well, an intuition about it. Very well, Mrs. Holt. I have a lot of faith in a woman's intuition. There has been a murder. I promise you I'll find it out before the night is over. Did you talk to Sergeant Matheson on the phone, Nick? Yes, and you should have heard the horse laugh he gave me when I suggested that Miles Kincaid might have been murdered. Oh, that must mean the handwriting experts are sure about the suicide note. They are. Matty says there's absolutely no question about it. Wasn't a forgery. Huh. Well, that pretty well settles it then, doesn't it? Mm, perhaps. But at least it won't hurt to take a look at Kincaid's home. Mm-mm. We're almost there, Nick. It's the house at the end of this street. All right. <laughs> Matty wasn't even going to hold an autopsy. Did you ask him to? I did, and he finally agreed to it. Good. All right. Hop out. Uh-huh. Uh, whom do you expect to see here, Nick? Kincaid's valet. 
A man named Harry Otis. Oh. Holt says he was probably the last man to see Kincaid alive. Yeah, but do you think you... What, what was that, Nick? Somebody moaning. Someone in pain. It came from those bushes by the side of the porch. Yeah, come on. There he is, Nick, lying in the bushes. All right, give me a hand, Patsy. Yeah. Pull him out. Yeah. Watch out for that branch. Okay. There, that oh. does it. My head. Yeah, what happened to you? Who, who are you? Nick Carter, private investigator. Who are you? Harry Otis. I'm... I was Mr. Kincaid's valet, sir. Well, what happened to you? Uh, someone rang the doorbell a few minutes ago. I... I opened the door, but there was no one there, so I stepped out on the porch. That's... That's all I remember. He must have been slugged from behind, Nick. Yeah, come on. Where are we going? Whoever slugged him may have wanted to get into the house. Could still be there. Okay, Nick. If Miles Kincaid committed suicide, Nick, what's this all about? Your guess is as good as mine, Patsy. Hmm. The front door is open. Don't make any noise. Uh-uh. No one in the living room. What, have you gone upstairs? Wait a minute. Oh. Listen. Nick, it's someone moving around. Right. Behind that closed door over there. Let's drop in on him. Unexpectedly. Right. Oh, confound it. Is the door locked? Nick? Yes. Oh. Guess we'll have to announce ourselves after all. Open up. Open this door. Oh. Oh, Climbing through the door. Oh. Not hurt, are you? No, but it was awful close, Nick. Oh, it's all quiet in there now. Afraid he's giving us the slip. That gunfire was probably intended to cover his getaway. What are we going to do? Only one thing to do. Shoot the lock off. Stand back. Yeah. There. Oh, Nick, he, he must have gone out that open window. Yeah, no use going after him in the dark. Oh, shucks. Oh, will you look at this room? It must have been Kincaid's study. Oh, it's a mess now. A friend tore it apart. Every drawer, every what file. What have you tore... been after? I don't know. There is one thing I do know. What's that, Nick? As of now, I'm definitely interested in how Miles Kincaid really died. Why, certainly, Mr. Carter. As Miles Kincaid's lawyer, I'm happy to help you clear up any questions you have regarding his death. Well, first, Mr. Randolph, who stood to benefit by his death? Well, all of his wealth is to be divided among various foundations and charitable institutions. What? He left no private bequest whatsoever? Only a comparatively small one to Melvin Dudley. Melvin Dudley? That's the publisher, isn't it? Yes, yes. Miles had arranged with Dudley to publish his memoirs, and he left a few thousand dollars to cover the cost. And Kincaid was writing his memoirs at the time of his death. He practically finished them, though that fact wasn't commonly known. I see. But what about all his property holdings? He must have had an enormous estate. Not anymore. He'd sold everything in the past year, converted it all into cash. There's just one piece of land that he held on to. Oh, where's that? Over in the poorer section of town, on Montrose Avenue. That's to be sold at auction now that he's dead. But I don't understand, Randolph. Why on earth would he have disposed of all his possessions at the age of 35? Hmm. You'd almost think he knew he was going to die. He did, Miss Bowen. What? What? He and his personal physician and I were the only ones who were in on his secret. What secret? Mr. Carter, in six weeks, Miles Kincaid would have been dead of heart trouble. Why are we going back to the office, Nick? I want to call Mary and check on the autopsy. Oh. Nick... You promised Hope that before the night is over, you'd at least know whether or not Kincaid was murdered. Do you think you will? I don't know. All I found out so far is that he had a better reason than we thought for doing away with himself. Yeah, but that still doesn't explain the mysterious visitor at his house tonight. And also, it... Oh, that's our phone, Nick. Oh, yeah, here, I got the key. Good. Hurry, Nick, before they hang up. Okay. Nick Carter speaking. Uh, Nick, this is Matty. Oh, yeah, Matty. I was just going to call you. What'd you find out? Kincaid was drowned, all right. His lungs are full of water. What? Well, that settles that. No, it doesn't, Nick. What do you mean? His lungs are full of water right enough, but the water was full of chlorine. Chlorine? Yeah. But there's no chlorine in lake water. You're right, Nick. But there's plenty of it in the city water system. And Miles Kincaid was drowned before he was thrown into the lake. Right. And that means murder. Murder. 
all, Nick knows at last that the wealthy young industrialist did not die by his own hand. But why Miles Kincaid left a suicide note, or why anyone would want to kill a man who was doomed to die from heart trouble within six weeks, are questions that are still unanswered. We'll continue this baffling adventure in just a moment. And now, back to The Case of the Flowery Farewell. Today's adventure with Nick Carter. Brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. As we pick up our story, a half an hour has passed. Nick and Patsy have joined Matty at the Kincaid home and, guided by Kincaid's valet, Harry Otis, have just entered the murdered man's bedroom. I see the bed's been made, Otis. Did you do that today? Uh, no, sir. No one's been in here all day. Well, in that case, Kincaid didn't sleep here last night, Nick. Apparently not, Matty. But his dressing gown's on the bed and there's one of his ties on the floor behind that chair. Yeah, was Kincaid fully dressed when your men found him, Matty? Why, sure. He had on a brown business suit, a blue shirt, and a green tie. A green tie? Yeah. Oh, no, no. You must be mistaken, Sergeant. Now, don't tell me. He had on a blue shirt and a green tie. But, Sergeant, Mr. Kincaid would never have worn a combination like that. He was very particular about his clothes. Now, listen, Otis. Hey, Matty, uh, Matty, wait a minute, wait a minute. This all adds up. Huh? Otis, take a look around. Does this room seem just about the same to you as always? Why, no, sir, it doesn't. The bed's been pushed back farther than usual, and the chairs are all against the wall. Hey, I'm beginning to catch on, Nick. Otis, where were you when your employer retired last night? I had the evening off, sir. I drew his bath water for him, then I went out. Uh-huh. When I got back, I assumed he was asleep. You drew his bath, huh? Yes, sir. Well, Mary, at least we know how he died. But... Huh? You think he was killed here, Nick? I do. He was probably getting undressed when the murderer found him. And they they had a fight? Yeah. That's why the furniture is out of place. Yeah. That would also account for the bruises on King Cade's face. We figured they was from being hit against the rocks in the lake. Yeah. Well, he was probably knocked unconscious in this room. Then the murderer took him into the bathroom and held his head underwater until he was dead. Oh, how horrible. And he dressed him again. Must have been in such a hurry he didn't see the tie King Cade had taken off. So he grabbed one out of the closet without even noticing the color. And then he carried him out shoved him in his own car, and drove to the lake. But what about the suicide note? I've got a little theory about that, too. What sort of theory? I'd rather not say until I've had a chance to confirm it. But how are you going to do that, Nick? By dropping in on a publisher named Melvin Dudley and asking him a few questions. I guess there's no one home. No, there must be, Patsy. I saw a light at the side of the house. Well, let's go around the side porch and take a look in the room where the light is. Uh Okay, Nick. Oh, you're just wasting time. No. Uh, Here, Nick. We can look in through this French window. Look at all those papers scattered all over the floor. Hey, looks like a cyclone's been through here. Hey, Matty. What? Look over there beside the sofa. Beside what? Sofa. Holy smoke. Nick, there's a man lying there. Smash the glass with your revolver. We've got to get in there. I'll say we have. All right, stand back. Can you reach the latch? Yeah. Yeah, I got it. Holy smoke. Look at this guy, Nick. Yeah. Shot through the head. That's Melvin Dudley, Nick. I've seen his picture in the paper. Well, you'll see it again tomorrow, Patsy, all over the front page. Hey, Matty. Yeah, Nick. This paper's on the floor, huh? Ever seen any just like them? What? Yeah, yeah, sure. They're the same kind of paper, the same handwriting as the suicide note. What I figured. And look, here's a typewritten letter among them. Huh? To Melvin Dudley from Miles Kincaid. What's it say, Nick? I'm enclosing the manuscript of my memoirs. Everything is here except the foreword, which I'm working on now. Well, there's the answer to your suicide note, Matty. What do you mean? It was written by Miles Kincaid, but it wasn't intended as a suicide note. Then huh? what was it, Nick? A page from the foreword to his memoirs. The murderer stole it last night from Kincaid's house and planted it in Kincaid's car as a suicide note. Oh, no wonder it sounded so flowery. We're up against the smart operator, Nick. Plenty smart, Matty. But he's made one big mistake. Huh? When he killed Melvin Dudley, he should have taken those memoirs with him. <laughs> Hello, Matty. I've spent a very dull night. 
reading Kincaid's memoirs. Oh, yeah? Find anything interesting in them? Yeah, but the most interesting part isn't there. Is that... I don't get you. Manny, unless I'm all wrong, these memoirs should hold the key to Kincaid's murder. How do you mean? Well, apparently, when Kincaid learned he was going to die, he decided to leave behind him a document that would expose somebody. Uh Uh-huh. Somebody he hated. And you think this somebody got wind of it and knocked Kincaid off so as to get hold of the document? I do. But he didn't get hold of it because Kincaid had already sent it to Dudley. Uh Uh-huh. The murderer realized that after he went back and searched Kincaid's study. So he went to Dudley's house to get it and ended by killing Dudley. Right. But look, Nick, why didn't the murderer take the memoirs while he was there? He did. He what? At least he took that part of them which incriminated him. There's one whole section missing from the manuscript. Oh. Got any idea what was in that section? Yes, Mary, I have. Good when, boy. When Douglas Holt and his wife put me on this case, Holt told me that he and Kincaid were once partners in an outfit called Inventors Incorporated. Inventors Incorporated? Yeah. But there's no mention of any such organization anywhere in the memoirs. Hey, Nick. Then maybe the... I'm back, oh. Nick. Oh, hello, Sergeant. Oh, hi, Patsy. Yeah, what did you find at the newspaper morgue, Patsy? You got any dope on Kincaid's background? Plenty, Nick. And about that company called Inventors Incorporated. There's yeah? something funny about that. Funny? In what way? Why, there was a third partner. Third partner? Uh-huh. Huh? Who was he? A man named Peter Jarrett. Peter Jarrett? Mm-hmm. Huh. No mention of him in the memoirs, either. Hey, Nick, are you thinking this Jarrett guy might be our man? I don't know about that, Matty. But I am thinking that it's strange that Holt and his wife didn't tell me about this, Peter Jarrett. I wonder why. I know I should have mentioned Peter Jarrett to you, Mr. Carter, but frankly, I was sticking to an agreement that Miles Kincaid and I made long ago. What sort of agreement, Mr. Holt? To cover up for Jarrett in spite of the raw deal he gave us. Oh, uh, he gave you a raw deal? He certainly did. Hmm. Jarrett wrecked Inventors Incorporated by walking out on us one day, taking with him what little capital we had. And you never saw him again? No, never. But I'm confident he's still alive. Nick, Peter Jarrett must be our man. Well, he certainly had a motive for killing Kincaid. If Kincaid was planning to expose him in the memoirs he was writing. You say Miles was writing his memoirs, Mr. Carter? Yes, he was. They were practically complete when he died. Well, then it all adds up, doesn't it? Only a man like Jared who wanted to get hold of those memoirs before they were published would have had a motive for killing a man who was going to die anyway. Yeah, but the question is, how can we get our hands on Jared? Well, I can tell you where his wife lives. She ought to know where he's hiding out if anybody does. Oh, good. We'll go see her. I have an idea that when we find Peter Jared, we'll have this case sewed up. Are you Mrs. Jarrett? What's it to you? I'm Nick Carter, private investigator. A dick, huh? You get out of here. Not just a moment, Mrs. Jarrett. I said, get out. Mrs. Jarrett, don't do that. Put that gun away, please. You come one step closer and I'll start shooting. So help me. I don't think you're going to shoot anyone with that gun. Get away from me. I'll take it. Why, you... And the next time you want to fire a gun, Mrs. Jarrett, remember to lift the safety catch. Nice going, Nick. (sighs) Pretty darn smart, ain't you? Now, perhaps you better talk to us. I ain't talking to no cops. Why not? Because I'm sick of you guys. You've been hounding me for ten years, ever since Pete disappeared. You wouldn't know where your husband is, would you? Are you crazy? I wouldn't be living like this if I knew. Him with all that dough. When did you see him last? I ain't seen him since the day he went to work and didn't come home. And where was your husband working the day he disappeared? He was working over at that house on Montrose Avenue. Montrose Avenue? What? Why, that's the one piece of property that Miles Kincaid held on to after he sold everything else. Yeah. Well, thank you, Mrs. Jarrett. I'm very grateful to you. What? I didn't do nothing for you. Oh, yes, you did. You just gave me the last piece of a very complicated jigsaw puzzle. Oh, Nick, what a horrible, musty old place. Should be musty. After all, nobody's been down in the cellar for over ten years. Not since Miles Kincaid and Douglas Holt closed up the business they called Inventors Incorporated. But what do you expect to find here, Nick? A key to three murders, I hope. Three? But only two men were killed. Patsy, if my hunch is right... 
Wait a minute. What do you see, Nick? Look where my flashlight's pointing. Notice anything about that slab of concrete over there? Uh, why, yes. It's a different color from the rest of the cellar floor. Right. Because it was laid at a different time. Let's see. It's about three feet wide and six feet long, isn't it? Nick, you think that's a grave? I do. I think a man has been buried under that slab of concrete for ten long years. Patsy stares at the circle of light from Nick's flashlight. Who was buried in the musty cellar on Montrose Avenue and what bearing his death has on the murders of Miles Kincaid and Melvin Dudley? We'll find out in just a moment. And now for the conclusion of The Case of the Flowery Farewell. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. Almost an hour has passed since Nick and Patsy discovered what Nick believes to be a grave in the cellar of the abandoned house on Montrose Avenue. They left the cellar for a time, but have now returned to it and are waiting impatiently. Not a sign of him yet, Nick. He'll be here, all right. Can't afford not to come. I still don't understand why you're so sure he's the murderer. You will before long. Yeah, but... Ah, hold it. Here he comes. Uh You down there, Carter? Yes, we're here. Come on down. What's this all about, anyway? Familiar territory to you, isn't it? It's been a long time since I was here. This is where Miles Kincaid and I had our laboratory. You, Miles Kincaid, and Peter Jarrett. Don't forget Jarrett, Mr. Holt. That's right. Well, by the way, have you got a line on his whereabouts yet? I've done better than that. I've found him. Well, well where is he? Right where you and Miles Kincaid buried him ten years ago. What are you talking about, Carter? I'm talking about murder. You and Kincaid killed Jarrett and buried him down here. That's ridiculous. Probably did it so that you could steal an invention of his. And you spread the word that he'd run off with your funds. You must be out of your mind. No, but I imagine you were nearly out of your mind when Melvin Dudley happened to mention to you that Kincaid was writing his memoirs. (sighs) Why should that worry me? Because you guessed that he was planning to expose your part in the murder. Something he couldn't have done during his lifetime without incriminating himself. What? When the police dig up Jarrett's body... They'll never dig it up. Because you won't be alive to tell them about it. Don't reach for your gun, Carter. I've got you both covered. Holt, you made a bad mistake when you admitted that your new Kincaid was a dying man. That was a tip-off on you. Especially since you neglected to tell me that fact when you hired me. Well, I slipped up once. But I won't slip this time. I'll take you first, Carter. No, Holt. I'll take you first. What the... Drop your gun, Holt. I can fight behind you. I'll kill you, you... Oh, my hand! (laughs) Oh, nice shooting, Nick. You cut that gun right out of his hand. And you made a nice dramatic entrance, Matty. <laughs> well, uh, you set the stage for it, Nick, when you put me behind that packing box. Oh, I thought you'd never come out of there, Sergeant. Yeah, well, I'd have been out sooner, Patsy. Only my pants got caught in a nail. Yeah. Oh, Sergeant. <laughs> yeah, and my new suit, too. <laughs> okay, Hope, let's get moving. No use hanging around this damp cellar. And we got a nice dry cell waiting for you down at headquarters. <laughs> Then Jared's body was buried in the cellar, Nick. Yes, Patsy. And the case is closed. Uh Uh-uh. Not quite, Nick Hmm? Carter. Not until you've told me how Holt found out that Kincaid was dying of heart trouble. Well, according to the statement Holt gave Matty down at headquarters, Kincaid told him. He did? Mm Mm-hmm. When Holt went to inquire about the memoirs, Kincaid gloated that he'd be dead in six weeks. And that everybody would know that Holt was a murderer. But why on earth did Kincaid want to expose Holt? Patsy, don't you remember what Mrs. Holt told us? Hmm? That she used to go with Kincaid? Well, Kincaid never forgave Holt for taking her away from him. Oh, I get it. He couldn't get even with Holt until after he himself was dead. That's right. Yeah, but I can't understand why Holt brought you in on this case. He didn't. His wife did. What? You mean it was her idea to hire you? Sure. She knew nothing about the murder of Peter Jarrett. And she had no idea that Holt had killed Kincaid. She just didn't believe that Kincaid had killed himself. Mm-hmm. And when she wanted to call you, her husband had to agree with her so she wouldn't get suspicious of him. That's it. Oh, brother. When you walked into that house and took the case, it must have been life's darkest moment for Douglas Holt. The darkest so far, Patsy. But the state is planning an even darker moment for him in the very near future. <laughs> Can you 
you tell us something about the adventure new post-war old Dutch cleanser is going to bring us next week, Nick? Next week, Mike, we're going to meet a man who was honest and upright for five years in order to build up to a fraud worth half a million dollars. Only his plan broke down because he put his fraud in an envelope. A fraud in an envelope? Well, that sounds exciting. What do you call this adventure? I call it The Case of the King's Apology. Friends, this is Nick Carter again. And I'd like to take this opportunity on behalf of the Cudahy Packing Company to salute the 49th Annual Convention of the National Association of Retail Grocers, which begins today in Atlantic City. The independent retail grocer is your good neighbor, bringing you fine foods from all parts of the nation and of the world. So let's all doff our hats to this very important businessman, the independent retail grocer. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented each week at this time by the Cudahy Packing Company. It is produced and directed by Jock McGregor and is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications Incorporated. Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy. Ed Latimer plays Matty. Today's script was written by Lou Schofield and Ken Pettis. Original music is played by Henry Silverne. This program is fictional and any resemblance to actual persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. This is Michael Fitzmaurice saying, when minutes count, use new post-war old Dutch cleanser. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.